said, we were started in uh, in the summer of 2020, um, where I was uh, developing small 3D printed scaffolds in a in a bedroom in Cardiff in a flat with my best friend. Um, whilst my dad was also developing software back home uh, in Gilwyn, which is in the South Wales Valleys. Um, since then, we've gone on to have multiple collaborations. Uh, one of our biggest was with the Swansea University Medical School. Um, developed a lot of a portfolio of products, patents, um, trademarks, etc. And uh, now we have quite a quite a strong company of a portfolio and a growing team. So it's a very exciting time to um, to be kind of taking a look in and see what we're doing. And uh, it's also an absolute pleasure to be working with Alpton Woods um, as our as our sole UK distributor, both in the scaffolds and also with our future bioprinting technology, which I'll also get onto um, with this presentation as well. So again, a little bit of company background. Um, it's a nice picture there just to kind of illustrate, gives you a bit more kind of meat and bread about what, what we're about. Um, so we actually have a, a small R&D centre at the Innovation Centre in Ebervale, which is uh, deep in the South Wales Valleys in Blinder Gwent. Um, we've, we are focused on the research development of novel 3D cell culture technologies. So we're not interested in looking at the competition and saying, you know, we want to do it better under kind of key principles. We look at the competition and say we want to do it differently because thinking outside the box and doing things in a different way is where true innovation can kind of really does come from um and we found that this has been um a really good way a really good kind of culture around the company to to create these next generation products and uh we've got the customer base to prove it as well uh we we did basically start with a smart cumbry collaboration with gelogen uh back in september 2021 where we are developing microfluidics, um, an extrusion bioprinter uh, type kind of setup. Uh, it was incredibly successful, and the company uh, had a batch production of, of bioprinters. Um, we, we have around 25, which with most of them being sold. Um, most of these universities across uh, Wales and kind of west of England, but also interest in Scotland as well. Um, and in the summer of last year, 2022, we achieved an Innovate UK Smart Grant uh, just shy of half a million uh, to develop um, a novel form of inkjet bioprinting, which we're, we're very excited about. Not only does it have applications in drug discovery and things like organoid development, but also has the ability to um, form vascularized tissue beds for uh, regenerative medicine, uh, more kind of high throughput drug discovery as well, as well as key, kind of key areas of cancer research where the vascular component is often overlooked and is, is quite a, an Achilles heel when it comes to drug development. Um, so I was going to start off really slow and say what is what is 3D and why is it better than 2D? Um, I'm sure a, a good few of you know this already, but it's a good way to start. Uh, so in the 2D environment, cells are classically grown on a flat surface. Um, the Petri dish has become, you know, kind of is really partnered up with when you think of a scientist. And cell culture in a 2D environment is great. There's, you know, it's, it's really served a good uh, kind of basis for scientific research over, over many decades but it's not about its limitations. Um, the biggest one to begin with is that a cell grown in a 2D environment has a kind of forced polarity with a basal and an apical side. Uh, not only does this affect the ultrastructure of the cell and the arrangement of the organelles, which is um, can be quite crucial for some cell types, especially stem cells and, and neurons, um, but also when we look at things like drug discovery experiments, the cells really have nowhere to go. Um, drugs that are put onto a 2D grown cell, um, more often than not, you get the result you're looking for, which could be in the case of a, a chemotherapy, you're going to get that toxic effect on the cell. Um, but in a 3D environment, that cell is much more likely to move around and evade. And that's often where you see that kind of failure um, with drug development, where you're getting a very good result in the 2D drug discovery stage. But when you actually come to the clinical trial stage, you see something much different. So in a 3D environment, the cells are grown in a more physiologically relevant cell structure and, and, and cell organizations. You have the cell to cell as well as the cell to matrix interactions. And this is also very crucial as well in, in terms of certain cells like chondrocytes, um, the cells of the musculoskeletal system or the cardiomyocytes, uh, often the cell to cell interaction, but as well as that, the cell to the kind of integrin uh, component of the cell membrane is incredibly important to get downstream signaling to get those more physiolog physiologically relevant um, outcomes. So that's really the difference between 2D and 3D. Um, it's not a bad idea to start in, your, in 2D in, if you're early on in your scientific research, but making that transition to 3D is, is you know, it has a whole host of benefits. Um, and it can also kind of, in some instances, 
mean you can avoid um, more the animal testing side of things, which is also becoming more and more difficult now due to new legislation that is coming out both in the UK, US and most parts of Europe. Um, so if we move on to what is 3D and, and different types of 3D, uh, 3D cell culture can really be broken down into two key categories. You've got scaffold free techniques and you have the scaffold techniques. Um, the easiest way to begin with the scaffold free is something called a hanging drop where cells can either be put into, um, so the cells are liberated from, um, a, so, so, so they're liberated from their 2D environments using things like trypsin or cell disassociation buffer. Um, they're then put into a media before being placed in a drop form onto a plate and being for, uh, being placed upside down into the incubator. Uh, the cells that are in that hanging drop will actually come together and form three dimensional bodies called spheroids. Um, in some instances, when you use iPSCs or other stem cells, um, you can also get the early embryoid bodies, which are, again are important for downstream organoid development. Um, now, we haven't really touched upon organoids, but it's another form of 3D where stem cells will come together to form something of a micro tissue. Um, I think you, you can get incredibly high uh, physiological response from organoids, and they're also being uh, researched more and more now as, as a therapeutic uh, type target or therapeutic use um, in, in the intervention of many diseases. Uh, but I won't touch upon organoids too much in this presentation because it's, it's, it is quite a complex field. Um, but I do encourage you to take a look at organoids if you get the chance. Another method is to use a, an agitation bioreactor method. Again, the cells are just in a free uh, cell culture kind of media type environment with constant movement, being allowed that chance to stick together and form these three dimensional structures, primarily cell to cell interaction. But then following this, you tend to get the ECM growth as well. So you get the cell to cell as well as, as the cell to matrix interaction. Um, then you get onto the scaffold technique. These are much more, uh, in my opinion, very easy to use. They're very uh, user friendly. Um, and if you can get the right scaffold, so if you used a, a polymeric plastic scaffold, for example, um, you can actually reduce your batch to batch consistency quite significantly. In terms of scaffolds, you, you can break it down into hydrogel and plastic scaffold. Um, one of the biggest on the market is matrigel sold, sold by Corning. Um, but even matrigel will, will admit that their batch to batch consistency is, is very, very high. Um, so that's why if you're really looking for that batch to batch consistency um, and reliability, you really want to look for a more of a plastic type scaffold. Um, so now I'm going to move on to what it is that we do exactly. So Copna Biotech has uh, developed a completely unique approach to 3D modeling and printing. Um, because of that, we can print very uh, difficult shapes that are, you know, tend to be seen as difficult, like concentric circles, for example. A lot of 3D printing companies will say, well, we can do concentric circles, but actually when you get down to it, what you're seeing is something similar to a kind of concentric poly polyhedron, polydecagon, something like that. Um, whereas our technology can actually get down to a, a really high level of accuracy. And because of that, we can actually control the pore size and distribution, which leads to a tunable oxygen and nutrient gradient across the interface. So I should have mentioned this in the scaffold technique, but if you just take a look at that matrix method to the right there, if you were to take your cell, your liberated cell suspension and um, seed your cells onto this structure, the cells are randomly distribute um, and they'll actually form pockets because they have no reason to, to move across the scaffold interface. Um, now, if you're looking to form things like spheroids, um, this can be good. But again, um, this kind of method is, is not very reliable because your pockets will will vary quite, quite significantly. So when you use the Copna Biotech scaffold, uh, because of the tunable oxygen nutrient gradient, the cells that are seeded into the center of the scaffold naturally emanate towards the periphery. So we get a balanced confluent system of cells every time. Um, so in the top right here, we're seeing the SEM images, uh, which came from the collaboration with Swansea University Medical School. Uh, this um, data was actually captured by Dr. Alan Bryant and Dr. Bethan R. Thomas, um, which shows exactly what I just said there in terms of the confluency of the cells. And um, we also get a because of this, we also get an incredibly high proliferation. So from day one to seven, we tend to see around a, a five to six fold increase, but we've had some customers reporting around eight to nine fold increase. Um, this is particularly important for things like exosome production. If your lab is looking to uh, grow cells purely to, to actually harvest exosomes, then you might find you're having difficulty in getting lots and lots of plastic. We're using lots of cell culture media um, 
and actually it's, it's a real pain to actually keep doing all of this and lots of cell culture media involved just to get a very small amount of exosome. So actually what you can do is use our scaffolds in a 24 well setting um, and get those exosomes much easier just by aspirating that media off of the scaffold. And if any of you are interested in exosome production and, and what we're doing exactly in that field, then please feel free to reach out to me after this meeting. Um, and I'll be, I'll be more than happy to actually put you in contact with some of our collaborators, as well as get you some, uh, some of those protocols as well. So as well as that, um, I did touch upon spheroids and organoids, but um, also there's a much nicer pitch which kind of sets the product up well here in the top right. So um, our scaffolds come in, in groups of 12, so you get 12 scaffolds for around £110, um, which is far cheaper than you know the, the other scaffolds that are on the market. But again, we're seeing the same, um, these benefits which I mentioned in terms of the spheroids and organoids, as well as the confidence in the cells. Um, I just want to bring your attention to the bottom left image here. Um, this is what's called an early embryoid body. Um, we can see clear differentiation um, just through a light microscope, which is pretty amazing, where we have a, a very clear, dense nucleus uh, with some differentiation starting to kind of arise from, from the outside. Um, so what, what our researchers are telling us is this, this is a clear embryoid body. But as well as that, when you aspirate from our scaffolds, like the person is doing, like the person is doing in the top right here, what you're actually doing is using that scaffold as a, a type of filter. So your early embryoid bodies are, are closer to uniform than what you would normally get if you just did them uh, using a gel like Mage gel, for example. So up to 200 microns in diameter, around 200 to 250, we can get these early embryoid bodies. We can aspirate them off of the scaffolds and then we can grow them either in a suspension or a gel from that point forward. And then we can get organoid bodies like we see on the right here. So this is a um, an intestinal organoid which is formed from our scaffolds. Um, so now that I've touched upon kind of, um, we've also got 3D culture which we split into the 2D and the 3D. Um, we've, we've touched upon within that 3D there's scaffold less and scaffold. So once, we, once we've now covered the plastic scaffold we're going to go into something a little more complex which is bioprinting. And the bioprinting is the idea of actually 3D printing a biological matrix which the cell can not only adhere to but infiltrate and start to deposit its own ECM whilst also still making those um, cell to cell interactions. Um, one question I get quite a bit is what is the difference between um, a biomaterial ink and a bio ink, um, which is in, in section B here of this, of this figure. I think it sets out really nicely. Um, if you were to mix cells into your biomaterial ink, then that is then a bio ink. You have a living cellular component to your ink. Um, but what you know, this was kind of very common in the early days of bioprinting. I think it was a, a really cool idea that you could get cells and 3D print them directly into a structure. But actually, the, the sheer stress, the, she, the sheer force, as well as the kind of prolonged time out of the environment, actually led to a significant drop in cell viability and subsequent cell proliferation post-print. So what we're seeing in the industry more and more now is that people are much more interested in 3D printing um, a basic scaffold sterilizing that scaffold and then seeding the cells on afterwards. Um, this way we're seeing cell viability closer to 90 to 95 percent as opposed to down to say 60 to 55 percent um, if you were to print the cells directly. So that's a decision to be made by the end user but you know we, we tend to recommend the, the scaffold printing followed by the cell seeding. But the general bioprinting workflow is design a scaffold uh, using a CAD software, upload that onto your 3D printer, uh, you have a biomaterial solution. Um, it may or may not have additives. So in the instance of alginate, you can actually have a, a very high concentration of alginate, which is very viscous. And then as soon as you put that alginate into a divalent cation like calcium, you get instant uh, gelation and a very, very solid scaffold. Um, but in some senses, you may you may just, uh, choose to use temperature as your method of printing. Um, there's, there's multiple aspects you can use here to control the biomaterial. But that control of the biomaterial is often the, um, the kind of key hurdle to overcome in bioprinting. But this is the basic workflow of designing a scaffold, 3D printing it, and then going on to culture. Um, so just by touching upon that first part there, the digital design that needs to be printed, you're going to be using a CAD model. Um, for those of you that don't know CAD, it stands for Computer Assisted Design. Uh, it's usually a very tedious process. Um, it, can, it can really take up your time. It can cause a lot of frustration as well. Um, but you tend to get your basic 3D model, 
and then you would then save that into what's called an STL format. Uh, the STL format is sliced into a geometric code. Um, that's because uh, the STL file can be read by computers very easily, but the G code, no, the STL cannot be read by 3D printers. They're very, very basic computers in a, in a sense. So that STL file needs to be split into something or sliced into something much more basic, which is geometric code. Geometric code can be uploaded onto the 3D printer, and then the printer uh, does the work and, and prints the object. So this has been the kind of workflow since the 1980s, I would say. Um, it's, it's not really been moved away from. Hardware in terms of 3D printing has improved decade by decade, year on year, but the software has stayed exactly the same. Um, and this is exactly why I decided to start Copner Biotech in the first place, uh, because we really did see a gap in the market here where if someone could take on the software element um, and come up with something you know, much better or even a little bit better, um, you're going to get immediate added value to your 3D printing um, outcomes and accuracy. So I was talking a little bit about STL there and then onto G-code. So two very important kind of sub words uh, in the 3D printing world. But this is GRAPE. And GRAPE stands for Graphical Rectangular Actual Positional Encoding. Um, it's a novel and proprietary modeling format, and it was developed by Copner Biotech, patented by Copner Biotech, and now being used across the world, both in our scaffolds that we print in-house, but also it's the core um, intellectual property as well in our bioprinting devices. So if I can bring your attention to the top left, um, I think this figure really kind of describes it as, as, well, as, as well as you can. Um, if this was your CAD model, so you're going to make a perfect circle here, um, so when you're doing your CAD and designing using a software, you've drawn a perfect circle and you think, well, this is exactly what I'm going to print. Um, but once you actually save from the CAD model to the STL file, um, what the computer does is overlays triangles to essentially try and image or try to imagine your 3D structure in a three dimensional setting. And what it does is actually get something a lot more blocky. So this is something similar to a kind of an octagon as opposed to a circle. Um, and what Grape can do is actually completely take these triangles out of the, out of the um, example using rectangles, which actually mold one another, one another much more much more perfectly. And then once we've done that, we can then put the triangles on top. So the triangles are actually put in a, in a format which is much more accurate than the CADs that are currently on the market. Um, so that's what you're seeing in the top right image. And then the top, the bottom right image is a scaffold that was made by one of our customers. Um, it's a concentric circle scaffold, um, and you can see that kind of perfect circular nature overlaid by the triangles there. Um, so that's our approach to uh, CAD. And now I just want to touch a little bit upon um, me methods of deposition in bioprinting. So most bioprinters that people have come across are extrusion. They use a, um, a type of force to extrude the bio ink, which has been loaded onto the printer. Uh, that could be pneumatic. It could be piston driven or it could be a screw. Um, so the pneumatic, you often need an airline or a condenser of some sort to, to apply pressure, um, which is not ideal because it takes up a lot of space in the, in the, in the lab. It's very messy to use. Um, pistons, a bit more accurate, but again, once you actually put that force onto the bio ink, either you're going to have very discrete changes to the ink due to the sheer force at the apex of the needle, or if you have cells inside of that bio ink, then you're going to really damage their viability post printing again due to the sheer force of being extruded through a small needle. Um, and the screw is, in my opinion, the more superior. So you have some bioprinter heads um, uh, by Viscotech, for example. Uh, they can print very high, very high fidelity, very, very high accuracy prints. Um, but again, because of the extrusion, you're going to get those limitations in cell viability and, and, and controllability of the actual bio ink. Um, You've also got inkjet bioprinting, the idea of actually loading your bio ink and then using um, a piezoelectric actuator or some kind of heater element to actually stimulate the bio ink into a droplet form. And then at a very high speed, they would shoot these droplets over a surface. Um, it's incredibly high accuracy due to the droplet nature, um, but you're limited to uh, print materials of low viscosity. If you had a, even a, a low viscosity material like 1% alginate, it really wouldn't be appropriate for inkjet. So that's the biggest limitation of the technology is the actual viscosity of the material um, and what you're actually limited to use with, with this kind of printing. But it is forecasted to be the preferred method by 2028. 
Um, what Coppola Biotech uh, does instead, so we use a form of extrusion. Uh, so we're doing similar uh, deposition to what you're seeing in the image here, but instead of using a syringe force, we use a disc pump. And with the disc pump, we can actually use a high amplitude, high frequency acoustic standing wave with a specially designed acoustic cavity. Um, we apply a pressure um, via this method to a, a, a microfluidic reservoir, which then del delivers the, the uh, material to the printhead itself. Um, and what you're seeing in terms of flow rate stability on the bottom right here, with a syringe pump, you're going to get constant on and off pressures as the printing um, as the printing takes place, which then leads to what's called an inertia. So as you go, as the print takes more time, so the 10, 20, 30 seconds uh, since the start of the print, you actually start to get a, a pressure build up inside of uh, your ink. Um, so you actually get the drooling and the bleeding through, which is not ideal uh, for high fidelity printing. But using the disc, disc, using the disc pump method, we can get a constant around constant pressure, which is much more accurate. And as well as that, you can see on the bottom left there the set point response where the syringe pump takes a far longer time to kind of get working properly in terms of uh, pressure allowance. Whereas with our disc pump, we can get there much quicker and we can stay at that pressure much more reliably. Um, so again, if you look at the top left image here, we've got our disc pump, which we then have a valve and a pressure meter. Uh, so at every, I believe at four times a second, we're, all, we're constantly measuring that pressure. Something you don't see with, with standard bioprinters in the market, you would see that the G code that is put onto the printer is going to give it specific coordinates, specific times to extrude, and then it's a matter of crossing your fingers and hoping for the best. Um, in terms of our disc pump and our pressure meter, we're taking at least four seconds, four readings a second. Um, we're applying a pressure to a reservoir, which then goes through a flow meter and towards the, the actual needle that's going to be depositing the material. Um, one really cool thing about our, our setup is that we can do uh, droplets of just a few uh, nanoliters or milliliters, no, microliters, my apologies, um, per deposition. But as well as that, we're also getting laminar flow as opposed to a turbulent, turbulent, turbulent flow. Um, one, one cool application of that is that when you're actually bioprinting collagen, that your monomers or your, your kind of uh, your pieces of collagen will line up much more accurately uh, prior to being deposited, which then kind of sets up the scaffold to be in a much nicer uh, structure for the cells to be seized on top of. Um, so this is kind of our unique approach to bioprinting. We couple our, our high um, accuracy software with a different method of deposition using the disk pump. And then we put that all together to, to actually develop this open source bioprinter. Um, when I say open source, I mean that if you look at number six, the actual microfluid reservoir, um, you can put in the material of your choice. Um, you would then optimize the pressure via the main computer, which is the, um, on the LCD screen, uh, number one here. Um, you'll optimize that pressure, save the pressure, and then you can use that same one every time for that specific material. Um, so that's what I mean by open source. So you actually get the software which allows you to make um, any scaffold that you would like to make. Um, you know, you can make very uh, high complexity geometries um, using your own material um, and then in a, in a much nice um, kind of microfluidic manner. So that is our current bioprinter on the market, but we also are developing and just launched with Appleton Woods at Lab Innovations, our new bioprinter. Um, if you'd like some more information on that, then please get in contact with me uh, after this meeting. But that particular bioprinter has a clean room technology. It also uses what's called a solid core XY movement, um, which is much more higher accuracy. It's actually kind of the, the movement that you would see in a CNC machine. We've also got the temperature control and multi-material applications within that bioprinter. So if you want to learn a little bit more, then please get in contact. Um, I'll also just finish off by kind of saying our current R&D activities. Uh, we're working on something we like to call negative space inkjet bioprinting. Uh, this is the project that's funded by the, um, the Innovate Smart Grant I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, so essentially what we're looking to do is we 3D print first a mold, which is 310 at the bottom right here. And then we have a negative space, which is the 320s. So uh, one application of this printing is actually first 3D printing a mold in gelatin with cells in it um, with a specific negative space which which actually resembles a capillary kind of tree network. So then within that negative space we can use inkjet technology to deposit endothelial cells to actually and then repeat that layer by layer to create a highly vascularized tissue construct. 
Um, so that's our kind of our biggest R&D activity at the moment. We're looking to finish that off by the end of um, May. Uh, and also the new Grape S1, which I just mentioned. Um, we did launch that in November at Birmingham at Lab Innovations with Appleton Woods. We then also went to Medica um, about a week or two later to do the European launch. And we're getting quite uh, very, very, very good uh, interest so far, uh, for even from large pharmaceutical sectors like Novartis, who are, who are quite keen on our technology already. Um, but we're seeing some really good uh, feedback and, and good movement in the European stage already. Um, so, yep, that's the end of my presentation. And um, if you have any questions, then please feel free to ask me now. 